Hello and welcome to another episode of Footlock. I'm Drew Stone and I'm here joined by my Footlock friend, Mr. Henry Catchpole. Hello. Who's wearing a cracking t-shirt, I must say. <laughs> yeah, sure. Which actually reminds me, I want to talk about t-shirts. Uh, in this week's episode, we have uh, a Nürburgring record breaker. We've got a new car from Gordon Murray. Uh, we're off to Le Mans. Um, and uh, there's a new Forza uh, expansion, which we want to talk about because it's super cool. There's a new uh, Bentley. But as I said, your t-shirt is very cool. You always we, we, we've also got a story about Yari Matty Latvala's balls. But yeah, that can that can wait. Stay tuned, everyone. Um, <laughs> you always come up with great T-shirts. I, I, I usually have something a bit more plain going on, but uh, that has reminded me uh, a long time ago. Uh, in a land far, far away. Yeah. Um, uh, Lavington Street, actually, in another part of London when we had the offices there. Uh, when we were still called X-Car, we had X-Car T-shirts made, uh, and they were brilliant, and people loved them, and we sent some out to uh, some of you. If any of you got one, and you have a picture of yourself you want to send in of you wearing it i'd really like to see it because we posted a whole bunch out back in the day but this was a long time ago obviously we've changed our name since then and we never had new t-shirts made so this conversation has come up that we should really have uh carfection t-shirts and some of you have been asking about it it's not really a way that we would be able to uh, generate money to help us do what we do but it's it not could be merch this you now merch is not not a huge margin in it and there's a lot of work on our end to actually get that working but i think they'd be cool to have yeah um and we we're wondering if you would be interested in having them as well and what you would like them to look like so um in the comments can you say well yes i i assume that you'd all be interested in in in, in at least seeing what they might look like but w would that be the kind of thing that you'd be willing to get uh it could be something that we give away as prizes we haven't really figured it out yet uh but what should they look like like do you just want like the, the logo or do you want do you want us to come up with some kind of design or do you have ideas for designs mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to throw that out there uh, straight away in Footlock. Yeah, immediately trying to gather the uh, the opinions of clearly our greatest fans. Footlock viewers are our greatest fans, and your comments are highly appreciated. Absolutely. Um, we I, bought, I bought this T-shirt in Japan, actually, in a Tamiya shop in, in Tokyo. So There you go. That's dedication to uh, T-shirt craft. It's a long way to go for a T-shirt, I <laughs> must is, say. It but It wasn't hugely expensive either, actually, which is good. I thought if you, if you went there... And After you factor in the, the plane fare. Yeah, in plane. <laughs> All right, fine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a long way to go, but a very cool T-shirt indeed. Um, last time on Footlock, we introduced uh, a hashtag, um, uh, which I'm not going to say now. I'm going to say at the end of the episode because uh, we uh, answered every question that was put to us that used that hashtag and made sure, even with people who didn't have questions, people just wanted to say it. And you have to watch right the way to the end of the episode where I'm going to repeat what that hashtag is and you can use it again this week. What, or what you might already know. Scroll forwards? Ah, but I'm not telling them at what point. And Footlock is getting longer and longer. So <laughs> we're rambling. Yeah, we're rambling. Anyway, um, T-shirts, let us know what you'd like or if you'd like them. And we're going to try and figure out if we can find the money to get some printed up and then hopefully just give some away um, either at events and, and whatnot. Can we get one of those T-shirt cannons? I've always wanted to get one of those. <laughs> really cool. Go, Poof. Isn't that how Maud Flanders died? In The Simpsons, she got hit by a t-shirt in a t-shirt cannon. Really? Is that and, <laughs> and knocked off the back of a, um, like, a grandstand. Ooh, a bobby pin! Oh! <laughs> wow, that's... That's an unfortunate way to go in um, cartoon land. Yes. Anyway, you can leave us a comment below uh, on YouTube or leave us a comment uh, or slide into our DMs on Instagram at Carfection Films. We're trying to build up a bit more of a following there. Uh, and we're going to be attending a lot of events over the summer with uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed. I'm going to be at Le Mans over the weekend, uh, which for this episode was last weekend. Um, so, and if you follow us on Instagram, you'll be able to see our stories and send us questions live while we're out in these places. Very and handy to do. we've started doing a few more of these uh, ask us anything about a particular car which one of the films we've released in the last few weeks was 992 one that we yep. did with where I just answered your questions and we put that through Instagram as well that's so, all through Instagram so yeah, yeah so. you have to be on Instagram following us there at Carfracture Films to get the most out of that I shot one this week actually on the um, Tesla Model 3 Ooh. yes which uh, by the time you watch this should be up on the channel um Anyway, follow us on Instagram at Carfection Films. Uh, into the news, and there's been quite a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, fast things first. Um, you like what I did there? Uh, the <laughs> Nurburgring. Nurburgring has long been the uh, the benchmark of fast cars, mm. um, and a new record has been set. Yeah, I mean we've we talked about Nurburgring lots before, but this is I. 
yeah i don't know whether again it's sort of are we excited about it or are we not does it mean anything it's a quick lap it was the volkswagen idr which is uh, the one that set the record up pikes peak as well and it's done a lap of six minutes and five seconds which is it's mind-blowing it's mind-blowing the trouble is obviously the 919 evo with that Tino bernhardt which <laughs> it raised the bar so far unfortunately high yeah because yeah. apart from that i was looking at the the nurburgring records i mean that that the Porsche 9, uh, uh, 919 Hybrid Evo, that was 5 minutes, 19 seconds, yeah. and one half. Um, so this is a full what, 40, uh, 50 seconds s- slower, which is a lot. But the Volkswagen IDR was a full 40 seconds quicker than the next electric car. Yes, which was the... Uh, the Neo, Neo EP9. EP9. Yes, um, which I think... Uh, I can't remember who's driving. Is Johnny Dumbrack? It was, it was Peter Dumbrack. Peter Dumbrack. Um, sorry, yes. Um, getting my dumb I'm not doing that from memory. I literally have this to be right. yeah. um, Which was, yeah, really quick. But that car is obviously, I know it's it's, it's a road biased car. It's I know it's a supercar, and it's sort of you know yeah. you could say it's you know scraping the um, limits of what a road car is, but it's a long way or the idr is is very much a race car oh completely Um, so it's a sort of yeah you can see why it took a full 40 seconds out of um out of the neo so well that so the for context the the neo ep9's time is about the same as the uh road legal uh record which is the aventador um lp774 svj which did it in in same 644 645 um uh time although the manti went manti racing tuned gt2 rs went quicker didn't it did it uh Same. that's not on this list it depends is on it, oh, it okay. depends on whether or not it's been recognized as a factory car okay. this yeah. is the whole yeah. other thing there is like a whole bunch of asterisks next to every single car that races yeah. it going well you know what tires was it on and but six minutes and five seconds is fast. For oh, an, and, really and, the, it, yeah. and it's not a track that necessarily lends itself well to an electric car because it's a long lap. So you mm-hmm. need to have something that's got the battery capacity. I know that in um, on, for the Pikes Peak Challenge, the, the, the car itself didn't have enough battery power to make it all the way there. They needed to use the regenerative braking to get enough power to actually finish the run. Wow. So that's how lean it was running. Now... Um, uh, but the ele- there, an electric car makes slightly more sense in a way because of the altitude yep. and the thinner air. It's harder to get combustion in an engine. Uh, electric cars are largely unaffected by it. Uh, but the Nurburgring is a challenge for anything that, that drives yeah. it. And to do it in six minutes. And, and I watched the lap. And because you don't have a roaring engine behind it, it feels <laughs> distressingly quick. It just, it, it's, you don't have any other kind of context to how it's moving. You just see kind of everything flashing by you go how is that car even holding on at that yeah. speed um uh it, it makes it of course and, and we, we said this again before but you know it six or five seconds that's what, six seconds only six seconds quicker than stefan Beloff went and that's just extraordinary when you think of you know if effectively how uh sounds i don't want to in any way denigrate what you know roman duma has done in that car but how easy i'm sure that idr is compared to yeah you know, it, it, portion. it didn't look that, it didn't look squirmy or uh, no, or in trouble at any physical point physical either because he's going to have you know paralysis of steering and stuff like that um so yeah it's, it's still bell off slap is just one of those things it, it brings it up again as to what what an extraordinary lap that was yeah have you have you watched the lap no, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I meant to watch it before I came down here, and then <laughs> completely forgot it was on my list of things. Uh, I, I watched yeah. it, and the, and it it's so smooth and so quick. The only thing that I couldn't quite um, figure out is he takes a, a, a kind of a weird line through carousel because oh, okay. no, normally you sit kind of quite low in carousel, yeah, um, and, and goes through it. He takes it really high, like all above the kind of concretey banked bit, like oh. quite high. I don't. Yeah, know. It has got a lot of arrow, hasn't it? So it could be yeah, something. It uh, just. That is, it is one of those things that you... I don't think the car likes being upset because there's a bit where it skips and you just hear the wheel spin up. Yeah. Like the, the, the engine note just goes super, super high yeah. for a second. It clearly likes it, being planted, but it, it, it feels like it's got so much aero it grip. Could be, it could be one of those things. I'm gonna, can I look it up quickly? Have we got time? Yeah, you can okay. look it up quickly. Um, so the, uh, the fact that... It, the, 
Roman Dumas, when he gets out of the car, he just looks so relaxed and so uh, just nonplussed by it. Okay, so shing, yeah, shing, you've got the bit now. Shing. So here he comes into carousel. He goes really high. Should we carousel? Oh yeah, that's really high, right? That's really odd because it looks as though he's tried to go in and actually overcooked it and then gone. Oh, I'm going to bail on this and just run around because it's it's odd that he should take any. He's almost sort of ditch hook the first bit and then gone around the outside. So you think he you could have actually gone quicker if he'd taken an optimum line? Not that I'm a Nurburgring expert. You must uh, you must know, but I think everyone knows kind of what usually the line is and it's such a recognizable turn as well yeah absolutely no, that's, um, so that's yeah there's probably even more in the tank as it were um, no pun intended on the, uh, on that lap so yeah possibly well, um, well done, or it might Volkswagen. just be one of the things that they decided that actually in terms of setup getting the car to drop into carousel and riding the you know notoriously bumpy yeah. concrete slabs in there actually you're not going to gain you know, enough just, just leave the car in an optimum setup and drive around the you know you make up more time by leaving the car in an optimum setup without him to go around there so yeah it could be that well there you go so, we've still got some questions that need answering on that but yes. an, an incredible feat well done uh, Romain Dumas well done Volkswagen and uh, Nürburgring still reigns supreme as the Absolutely. place to uh, get your speed kicks as it were talking of um Volkswagen and R. Yeah. Can I do my Yari Matty story? Okay. Now? And yes. It's going in let's early, just, isn't it? Let's, let's, just, let's just get it in. Let's just get this over yeah, with. Let's yeah. just hear All right. it. It's, so I, I had, um, I went to a Volkswagen dinner with uh, Jos Capito, yeah. who's head of um, Volkswagen R, was previously ran there, what is BMW, then Porsche, uh, ran the uh, Ford and WRC, then set up the hugely successful Volkswagen WRC um, era as well. Anyway, dinner with him. I'd met him before at the end of his forward era in fact and he's always good good value and i was asking him about various things asking him in fact why andreas mickelson couldn't seem to get it together sort of in that that hyundai and stuff because he's obviously worked with them at, at vw anyway i said to him it's all about confidence started talking about yari Matti at latvler because he actually said he was pound for pound the most talented driver he'd ever worked with uh, in terms of his just sheer feel for the car but he's a driver that always drives off confidence 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 and you see him at the end of the stages and he just can't get it together and you always hear it anyway he said do you remember his, i think it was uh wells rally gb rally doesn't really matter yari comes over radio at the end of the stage says ah oh, you know he's um, talking to his engineer oh, it's just i have no confidence in the in the car and that sort of typical yari matthew way and um engineers are sort of saying single click here there so sort of just trying to sort things out and just just lost it he was just like give me the phone and said Yari, you there? And he said, Mika, Mika until his code right. Are you there? Mika's sort of like, yes, yes, I'm here. Mika, can you hear me? Yes. Is, is Yari there? Yes. Grab Yari's balls. <laughs> and Mika sort of says, pause. And Mika, sorry, boss? Is Yari there? Yes. Grab his balls. Re really? Bo yeah, can you reach them? Yes. Well, grab them. There's this pause then, sort of in the whole of the sort of obviously in the service part, they're all just sitting there going, What's the boss doing? What's the boss doing? And he comes and he gives it a Mika? Yes, boss. Have you grabbed Yari's balls? Yes. <laughs> Yari, did you feel anything? <laughs> yes. Right. Well, now we know Yari has balls. <laughs> Use them <laughs> and puts the phone down. <laughs> Next two stages, Yari goes quickest. So oh, that's it's, good. Of, it's, it's just, it was, I thought that was, that was a a great great story from Yost so that, that it was all sorts of other things perhaps I'll drop in Yost stories over the next few foot long yes there. well there <laughs> you go <laughs> um, I'd, I'd also like to add if you're in a, any kind of position of responsibility at your work don't recommend that your co-workers <laughs> grab each other by the balls um i am pretty sure that violates several hr violations yeah i'm um, quite glad you never said to charlie to do that to me so uh, no don't yeah. ever do no, that, no no well <laughs> there you go it makes for good uh, anecdote fodder at footlock but not yeah. necessarily great business practice mm. um Anyway, moving on from the extremely fast... <laughs> How do you move on from that? I don't know. <laughs> Segway uh, to the slightly more sedate. Bentley um, have unveiled the new Flying Spur. Yes. And where previously the Flying Spur uh, very much felt like a an adapted Continental GT, it's now on an all-new platform. Um, for, Is that right? So yeah. it's got no... No, yeah, uh, it's uh, the interior still looks a lot like the mm. uh, inherits a lot from the design of the new Continental GT, but it has an all new platform. Uh, mm. it, it has some similar features: the uh, uh, forty-eight volt anti-roll system that the Bentayga has, and and it's still got the eight-speed DSG. Yes, I which so. I thought was sort of slightly 
odd in a way because yes whilst i get that the you know the bentley's um still a sporting car to some extent you know it's not it's not the rolls royce sort of Mm -hmm. um levels of sort of waftiness perhaps but uh putting that dual clutch box in there we know they just it was one of the things i noticed in the continental gt It, it it's great particularly in Contra GT, because it does add just that little bit more um, extra bit of sportiness in there. But you would have thought in the the Flying Spur they would have potentially opted for. Or it be interesting to see how they adapt the dual clutch to give it that smoothness, mm. which, um, which we know people can. So it's something McLaren talked about with their GT that they've unveiled and talked about actually adapting the... Um, the way the clutches engage and stuff like that to give it more of an, an auto box feel to it to, to yes promote smoothness I suppose so it'll be interesting to see what they do with that I think there's still very much a um, a lean on the fact that it can be aggressive mm. um, but it's not 16 2 and 3.7 seconds yeah. so I mean, this is uh, it's not slow no um, 3.7 seconds 3.7 seconds yeah. for for that I mean it's, I, was, I was writing an article it the weighs day. the same as a Bentayga yeah, it's it is nuts. How mm-hmm. I I was doing writing an article the other day, and uh, looking back at tests we did sort of find find probably fifteen years ago now, but sort of figuring stuff and to get anything to dip under four seconds was seriously impressive. You know, anything beginning with a three, and now we've got this stuff doing yeah heavy and heavy seven. stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's uh, insane. Six hundred and twenty six horsepower, six hundred and sixty four pounds feet of torque mm-hmm. um, from the six liter W twelve engine. Uh, and uh, it looks better than ever. Um, Talking of looks, have you seen they've they've redesigned the flying bee badge at the front? Yeah, with a little LED light. Do we like it? Do we not? Um, Do you like it? I, I quite like the overall design. I'm not sure about the part of me goes, "Ooh, that's really cool." It's got a flashing light in it, but um, I, 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 I like the idea of it innovating a little bit because all these uh, mascots have got quite a bit of heritage. Mm. Uh, I'm trying, and to they have always obviously evolved over it. time. It's, there we um, go. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 bold. Um, uh, I don't think it's the be all and end all. Hey, no pun intended. Um, uh, but it's nice. I think the whole front looks. Uh, to me, the, that was the, the reason I never quite gravitated towards the flying spars. It just felt like a slightly less attractive version of the Continental. But now mm. it feels like it's its own thing. I think the biggest thing is the swage line. If I got that right, down the that the, they've interrupted to give the rear haunches much more of a sort of much more it, definition, and that yeah. really helps actually. It's it's it's, a, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a nice touch, um, and it, it it gives it more of that kind of saloon car feel. Yeah. Um, so this presumably could be going up against things like the higher end Panameras, which is kind of interesting considering mm. how much is shared between. Um, uh, Bentley and Porsche from the the the, the Panamera um, for the Continental. Yeah. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, I, I always remember actually the Flying Spur was always surprisingly good to drive as well. I drove the second generation. There was a notoriously bad Bentley launch uh, out in uh, Boston, which was just it was terrible. The route was really long, but just totally congested with traffic, and it was all fifty mile an hour limit. It was just just terrible um and i fed this back in sort of no uncertain terms and uh the next bentley launch i went on which is about a, I don't know, six months later or something like that as it happened and uh Eichhorn, who was the chief engineer at bentley at the time um said oh yes you you didn't get a chance to drive the bentley properly and i can't remember where we were spain i think and they said I happen to have a, a flying spur here. Let's take it. You, know, you can drive <laughs> drive back to the hotel. And he sat in the passenger seat with me <laughs> with two other people from Bentley in the back as well. And I then drove it quite, I thought, right, okay, fair enough. And got stuck in and drove it quite quickly. And it was really nice. It had a long wheelbase and you could actually just sort of, it, it was good. Um, and um, he, oh, he enjoyed it, said I'd driven it very well. Nice. The people in the back, not so not much. So much. You know, yeah. Got there. I think we, we, we enjoyed it. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's surprisingly good to drive the old flying spur. I think it's good to, for it to differentiate itself between um, and not just feel like a cheaper Mulsanne. Like it actually feels like it's mm. uh, like far more of a kind of a sporty saloon rather yeah, it's than definitely a luxury. A, you know, it's, it's a you know, bedfellow of the Continental rather than being a, yeah. a cheaper Mulsanne. Oh yeah, completely. It, so. And and um, well, we'll in due course we'll get a chance to drive it and let you know about it. Mm. Um, 
Moving on, uh, E3, uh, the big video games conference, has uh, happened in LA. I thought we were going to talk about the bicycle race for a minute. No. E3, Harold Becker. It's a, a no. Bicycle, you know, it's, the, it's like E3, what is that? I don't know. It's games. It's the, uh, yeah. It's, E3 has long since been the... Don't look at me like that. I'm looking at you because you like you, you spend time in games in your spare time. I spend my time cycling. I, well, I used, to, I used to be... Clashing of worlds. There I used go. to be a video game journalist a long, yeah, long, long time ago. Um, E3 <laughs> has happened. Uh, all the major publishers uh, like Microsoft have given uh, press conferences. And in the Microsoft press conference, it came out that Forza uh, now has a... Um, uh, an add-on is that the best way to describe it what do they call it expansion pack. Uh, expansion pack yeah for lego as in you can the speed champions lego which are the models which are about i don't know six inches long <laughs> <laughs> oh my word you're now gonna try and show what six inches looks like. <laughs> it's about that <laughs> six inches um uh, we're descending into penis jokes this is how bad it's got people uh, yeah you can race those cars uh in a Lego environment within Forza. And I think we've got some footage of that now that we can show. And it looks fun. Brilliant. It, it looks it? It really, looks really good. good. Like, I think yeah. um, I was talking to some of the GameSpot guys, GameSpot being uh, one of our sister sites, uh, where obviously for anything from E3, you can definitely check that out at GameSpot.com. But they were they told me about it because I'd missed it in the, in the press conference. And uh, they were like, yeah, well, can't believe no one's ever thought of this before. I went, oh, that's a good point, actually. But then Lego Star Wars didn't make sense until someone thought of that as well. So, uh, But I suppose it's sort of because the Lego movies have been I mean, out that long, sort of in terms of, I mean, I know they have for a while, but, but it's going to take some time. And it does look very much like sort of footage from yeah. those movies. Um, yeah, no, uh, but the video games have been a lo- around longer yeah. than the, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, like the, Lego Star Wars video games had been around yeah. longer than the movies even had. So it's, it's, it's just quite interesting. I wonder if the physics is going to be the same. Uh, by the time you watch this, it's going to be out, actually, because the uh, expansion comes out on June 13th, or came out on June 13th. Um, so uh, if you have played it, um, please leave us a comment, because um, I don't... Uh, I'm, I've never been a huge Forza fan. I was, I've always been more... Uh, a Gran Turismo person yeah. um, so I'd be quite interested to know what uh, if any of you have played it what you think of it just thought it was a nice little touch because we're we're, pro- we're keen on a bit of Lego here yeah, at Carfection exactly. yeah. um, uh, as you may have seen if you've been following us on the channel for a while uh, so that's quite an interesting thing to have seen um, now Gordon Murray yes I want to talk to you about Gordon Murray uh, Gordon Murray obviously legendary F1 designer Mm -hmm. not just the car the f1 but formula one uh, in general um responsible for some of the most outlandish formula one designs and successful uh, it's uh, it's important to say uh but most famous for the uh, mclaren f1 arguably has a new car now we knew he was working on this we we uh, as far as we could tell for the last two years or so we we were aware that he was working on it and we've seen our first couple of pictures of it um, uh, in fact, they sent me a very nice poster of it, which was quite nice. So yeah, the, lucky you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the T50 yeah. is the name. So what do you make of this? Well, 50 is obviously it's 50 years of him in design, the industry. Isn't it, and sort mm. of, um, it's very exciting, isn't it, really? I think there's, there's just, well, I find it very exciting. Um, it's a, some cars you have to question whether you're, instinctively excited by it or not which a lot of the more recent supercars sort of perhaps things like um things like the center which i you know ended up really really liking but you you wonder does it need to be there does it sort of and this yeah. just you look at the the things that it's doing and it is taking a different approach to things which is is really refreshing particularly in um not going for it's got a lot of power what is it 641 brake horsepower um, but it's the way it produces that power, so a naturally aspirated engine. And then the weight, yeah, that, 980 kilos. That's the big one, isn't it? Yes, yeah, sub one ton car delivering that kind of power. I mean, that immediately almost... We always talk about what the, the, the Bugatti Chiron had to bought, a 500 brake horsepower per ton ratio. Yeah. And that always felt like a good, cause good ballpark number for a very powerful car. And you, you start to see things like... Um, Caterham's like getting towards that or BAC yeah. Monos uh, and now you're getting it well with this kind of horsepower in a sub 1000 kilo 
car. Mm. So that is kind of mind boggling. It's it, it feels like Gordon Murray kind of took over where Colin Chapman left off in terms of like promoting lightweight and making it all all even, about that. Even in the things that he says, you know, it, it does all. And he's you know admitted that obviously Colin was, um, you know, his inspiration for for so many things. And I think he he actually turned down going to work for Colin Chapman. Um, really sort of in his earlier career because he felt there'd be too much of a clash and almost yeah. didn't want to work with his his hero like that he wanted to you know forge his own path with things but um but yeah it's just some of the other things about it so talk well the light it's only got 341 pounds foot of torque from this this 3.9 liter um naturally aspirated v12 um which obviously you might look at and go well, 300 that's not very much but of course lightweight you don't, need you don't need torque. huge amounts of torque and um, with the way you can you know these engines you you can make it drivable with not a huge amount and it's still plenty of torque isn't mm. it um, the engine's also going to rev to over 12,000 RPM yeah which, I feel like he hasn't let go of that whole kind of Formula 1 yeah, ethos just yeah. so it's going to scream yeah, it's absolutely. going to sound phenomenal well, you get the feeling he's, he's looked at the Cosworth one in the Valkyrie and gone yep that'll do for me so just different kinds of um, obviously parameters it's a smaller engine uh, than that it's going to have a lot of titanium inside by by all accounts mm. um, so yeah it's it's going to be pretty cool H pattern manual gearbox that, by, that to me is is no one no one is really at that level even considering doing manual gearboxes anymore people are dropping by the wayside one by one and you know we still find them in enthusiast level cars yeah but an H pattern gearbox I mean <laughs> that's almost terrifying the idea that this thing could be going that quick um, it's brilliant I, revving to 12,000 RPM and then shifting by hand yeah. getting that how wrong how exciting is that yeah getting that wrong will be yeah catastrophic absolutely but getting it right because <laughs> yeah. a shift in a, a shift in an F1 is extraordinary because it's, it's a very tight ratio or tight um the spines on the box are very, very tight in terms of the um, the gate. Sorry, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. The, the throw across the gate um, is is very narrow, and so when you get a shift right, when you go from second to third, it for the first few shifts it feels like, oh, have I gone back to first there? So you dent sort of, you know, you feel your way into yeah. it before you. But so if you if you want to do it third to fourth, much easier, pull straight back. But when you nail a shift in that full on um up change it's so much more exciting than just pulling a paddle because and you get that feeling of sustained rush in a way it it's just amazing so to to yeah to have a, a manual box i think it's brilliant and he's apparently been talking to customers or potential customers about this car he's only going to sell a hundred of them yep. produce them all in one year um but he's obviously he's done his research he reckons there's enough people out there that will happily have a manual gearbox in the car so why not well this this kind of leads me on to the 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 main point of discussion here is that those hundred people will be looking to put down two million pounds for this mm -hmm. car yeah plus taxes plus taxes so that in no uncertain terms is a lot of money mm -hmm. for a car um especially for one that a hundred are being built of mm -hmm. um so we see uh, obviously limited edition uh, Bugattis that are one-offs going for ridiculous amounts of money but this is a car that's going to be a hundred of so it's limited but a fair few two million pounds plus taxes on 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 an unproven um, platform it's not an adaptation it's not <clears throat> pardon me it's not Ferrari with you know a, a dedicated no, factory no, and, not, and, no. and and a, and a guarantee that this is going to work and a guarantee that you know no. the resale value is going to to exist. Gordon um, Murray is your guarantee. Basically. Gordon so Murray, that's, you, yes. you are putting faith in but, in him. But as this is the first time since um, since the light car company that he's produced a car that's just him in his company. He's, yeah, he's, probably, he's, yes. he's, yeah. he's, he's worked with Mercedes, didn't he? But yeah, but this is apart slightly. Yeah, yeah, and and with. Um, TVR as well. He's yeah, doing work with them. We'll see where that goes. Yeah. Does that mean the end for that? Does it? <sighs> I don't know. But it's a punt uh, to putting to you putting a deposit down for a two million pound car. <clears throat> and here's the question: Once you get to the upper echelons of two million pounds for a car, 
does it matter if it's two or three or five or ten? Like you're you're now appealing to people with so much money. Does the the amount of zeros mean less and less? It Probably. Does it not yeah, mean I, th- anything. I mean, I, th- I, th- I suppose. I'm, we don't know because we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, motion journalism doesn't pay the pay yeah. that much. But Shocking that, but no, it doesn't. Um, unless you're Clarkson, obviously. Um, but to these people, you know, he's as he said, he's talked to potential customers, and these are people presumably who already own cars that are worth that much, and yeah. probably more than one. At which point, it's not a sort of it's not like you or me who would potentially have to you know we saved and saved and saved and saved and had all our sort of you know even if we were. It, it would be a massive out. You get the feeling that this is these are the cars that will go into collections mm-hmm. um, where people can afford them, and then I don't know. Perhaps it just doesn't doesn't even register particularly sort of. And and it feels like since yeah, I remember the when the F1 came out and that was what six hundred thirty thousand pounds or something there or thereabouts. It was six hundred grand, I'm sure, and that seems a phenomenal amount of money. It was just it was. It was way beyond yeah. anything else out there. It seemed ludicrous, and yet now these days, actually, two million. It, it wasn't a number that I really balked at in some respects because we've seen it before now. It's not. I threw it out as a question in the office, yeah. like, "Oh my god, what do you think this is going to cost?" And George went, two million quid." I was like, "Yeah," <laughs> and I was taken aback because yeah. that's not that is no longer an unreasonable guess for a no. car, and. Though I don't think he's going to have too much difficulty in finding a hundred people to spend it, but okay. where where is that line now? Where is the point at which? Because if you're talking sub a hundred thousand pounds, people are making a very careful decision a lot of the time because that mm-hmm. might be their one or one of only one or two cars that they have, um, and, and so people are being very considerate. There's there's uh, the competition has to be factored in. Then when you get to say the level of a Phantom, so several hundred thousand pounds the options that you can buy on there can easily exceed the yeah. value of the car. So it's, it, it feels like there's, and then there's lots and lots of cars you can pick from at that level. So there's so much, there's not just one or two cars that cost multiple millions of pounds. There's a good handful of them. The McLaren yeah. F1 stood pretty much head and shoulders above anything else yep. in terms of price. But now if you've got 2 million quid in your pocket and you want to buy one car that's brand new, you actually have options. How yeah. how insane is that, <laughs> that we live in a world where you, you can shop around with your 2 million pounds yeah. for one car? The Veyron, obviously, I think was the car that... So the McLaren F1 almost didn't change the market because it didn't sort of really... It was really, I think, a struggle to sell um, all those cars and convince people. Veyron, the same by all accounts, you know, they really struggled to sell those at whatever it was, you know, a million, um, a million pounds for each one of those. And that still felt like a huge amount of money when that was I launched. think that and was th- the sticker price, but I think they ended up charging, they actually made a loss on that at a million pounds ago, yeah, but no one paid that it, so. because everyone customized them and had extra stuff done Absolutely, to it. So they cost, yes. they didn't, they didn't blink at five or six million pounds for those going for once customization had been done to them. Yeah. But it was, do you know what I mean? But that was the car that felt like sort of. I think you're right. After yeah. that, what came after that? Um, and it's sort of, and then it gained more momentum with the triumvirate of LaFerrari 918. Yep. One. Once they they sort of hit the spot of then all car prices sort of doing that anyway. And sort of since then, it's it seems to have become accepted that people will pay. Yeah. Yeah, and this isn't even the last car that costs this much that we're going to be talking about over the summer. So stay tuned yeah. to Car Fiction. We have some more insights which on cars we can't talk about uh, at the moment that we have some insight on that are coming that cost that again. So if you are uh, that one Car Fiction viewer who does have two million just burning a hole in your pocket, <laughs> don't spend we it have, straight we away. Have lots of Car Fiction viewers like that, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Sometimes I wonder if we bundled up all of our Car Fiction viewers together whether we could afford something like this. We just <laughs> well, have like a crowdfunding, crowdfund ourselves a car, <laughs> and then we can all go and have a track day. It would make it like two laps before yeah. someone would bin it, and it would get really uh, angry. Um, um, a few other things about the car, which I think obviously three seats, like the yes, the like the F1, he's, um, he's, doors like the f1 he's very much pitching this as a successor to the f1 um which is interesting we were having this discussion earlier about how much ownership can gordon murray claim to have over the original f1 and obviously obviously mclaren's got the speed tail which they're sort of pitching as the successor to the also three seats and kind of that gt and 
there's lots of things that went on into making that car. Gordon Murray's design, mm. Ron Dennis signing the, the, the checks, BMW providing the engine. Yeah, Peter Stevens doing, you know, a lot of, and, and all the guys involved in, yeah. in the car. So, yeah. But in the kind of the uh, the PR bump that we've been getting about the, 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 the Gordon Murray car, it's like, yes, this is the success not even like spiritual success like this is the the yeah. car that naturally follows on from the f1 yeah. 30 years later which is just it, it's it's ambitious but yeah three seats dihedral doors and it's got the little scoop on the top yeah um because so that's interesting you just read somewhere that um it's that's a ram air effect will actually take it up to about 700 brake horsepower um with at speed so that's kind of in the same way that you get with uh, GT3 RS when it has the scoops on the side mm. ram air effect and actually take it well above the 530 brake horsepower um, that's advertised so yeah um, thankfully we have got ABS on this unlike the <laughs> I think that's a legal requirement <laughs> Un- unlike, the original, else. Well, yeah. you know, unlike the original unlike the original F1 is going carbon ceramic brakes fairly obviously as well so that'll hopefully rectify one of the, the weak points of, of an F1 it'll actually um, stop exactly yeah. yeah traction control but no um, uh, stability control on the car so, so it's going to be leery you're going to have to know what you're doing certainly um, so well yeah. interesting to see what it does with the steering as well whether it goes down the um, power assistance route or not um, so yeah I mean which with the lightweight you know it doesn't necessarily have to so, no no it, yeah, and, it and it's not a prerequisite I think this is the thing though we know that these cars if 100 get made and 100 get bought a handful are going to be driven often yeah. maybe one or two are going to be driven a lot um a lot of these are going to be as is the um, unfortunate nature of the industry is that a lot of these it's like buying property in london like yeah. some people are doing it buying a house to live in some people are buying it as an investment and this car might unfortunately fall into that but well if you're, if you're charging two million you can't stop you do what you want pick, with it too, yeah and you can't as you know there's a seller you're not going to be too picky about who's willing to cough up two million for it so no i wouldn't um, have thought anyway so the only thing we can hope for is that of those hundred they let us drive one of them that would be nice that me? would be lovely yeah, would be, um be and nice. uh so we can actually share with you uh, what it is like to drive and I think yeah. um, I think the rest of the world would be very grateful for the <laughs> opportunity just to get the insight because these people you know a hundred get sold we might not even know the vast majority of people who have bought one because they just go into private collections yeah, absolutely um, the, oh, the other thing we haven't mentioned yet is the Aero yes which is going to have sort of a twofold effect of uh, well it's it's using the technology from the late 70s BT 46 fan car um, that was obviously it wasn't bad it was never banned it was withdrawn it, from competition having well it was never it was never explicitly described as creating vacuum or low pressure <laughs> under the car it was like an exhaust yeah. a really yeah, yeah, yeah. It was bizarrely cool, huge cooling, wasn't it, yeah it was oh yeah i'm just gonna put this huge fan yeah. under the car just to blow air out. Yeah. like that uh, anyway it's gonna be a 400 millimeter fan on the back of um this new t50 um giving it ground effect basically sort of the creating all the downforce from underneath the car and as we know nothing ever goes wrong with ground effect cars <laughs> it is a, a it, when it works it works really well but it's like all aero as soon as it doesn't work you're going way too quick for that to yeah uh, it's certainly gonna be interesting to see how uh, he's already i think signed a deal with somebody that's got a, a you know moving road um wind tunnel so um yeah a moving road wind tunnel yeah so you, so rather than just like a rolling a road in a wind tunnel yeah basically because that's how obviously you get all sorts of and particularly given you're getting ground it, effects yeah. um off it you need the the moving surface below the car to you check know, it's, it's working exactly yeah yeah it's a, it's a fairly major major part of that so yeah it's um it's exciting isn't it it uh, it is it weighs the same as an mx5 with a small child in it <laughs> just just to put it in context of how much that is to weigh yeah um <laughs> and same size as over footprint as a as a i think ford focus or a 911 yeah tiny um, little so, thing yeah, so tiny not, little thing not um so gordon murray is throwing his hat back into the ring i'm looking at the 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 pitch here we'll put it up on screen the we haven't uh, got there's no um uh, cg mock-ups of it yet we've just got this great hand-drawn yeah uh, you've probably sketch. seen it by now it's yeah it's, it's, it's done the it's, it is really lovely i mean his um 
penmanship is mm. is extraordinary. He does do lovely. Diagrams. It probably sells it more than a render would oh, do. Absolutely, but it does yeah. also crucially leave quite a bit of. Um, design yeah, touches somewhere sort of it's not like the sort of the the porsche cutaways that they always send out and are, are just beautiful of the sort of cars but are really really um detailed and, and tech heavy obviously because they're of a finished car this is somewhere between a, a render and a and a yeah full technical drawing so uh, uh yeah. very very exciting that amount of aero that lack of weight manual gearbox um it's going to be something special yeah i wonder he's going to get to the test driving um, I, d I don't know. <laughs> well, this is this is. Uh, we were talking about this in the office because we were mm. having a discussion about who the um, greatest test driver of all time is, and mm. uh, obviously Andy Wallace's name came up, who did uh, the test driving on the McLaren F1. Uh, but that discussion came up because of the passing of Norman Dewis, mm. um, legendary test driver, worked for Jaguar from 1952 until 1985. Uh, was instrumental in the development of cars like the C-Type, the D-Type, and the E-Type. Um, XJ13, of course. XJ13, yeah. um, and raced at Le Mans, raced at the Mille Miglia. He was he raced in the 1955 Le Mans. Well, this was interesting because he didn't he didn't actually race very much, did he? Because he was too valuable to Jaguar as a. They didn't. He was driver. not. He was not due to race at all. But uh, another uh, driver had uh, pulled out. Yeah. The, it was the same for um, Alan Hart, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, um, the um, the 1955 Le Mans is, uh, for those of you who are um, uh, aware or, or motorsport fans will undoubtedly know, it's the, it was the most catastrophic race incident uh, of any kind um, when uh, a, a car tumbled into the audience and and killed many many people wiped out entire six people i think it yeah was. wiped it out wasn't. families worth of people in a time where um no one knew uh, there was no real radio coverage or, or or mass communication system to the rest of the audience and there was a quarter of a million people watching the race so they couldn't stop the race because everyone would just leave and it would have stopped well, the emergency sort of, services from getting say, in this is um the things so i've you know, spoken to various people. I spoke to John Fitch, who was racing as well for Mercedes. I spoke to um, Sterling Moss as well. Uh, they had completely opposing views as to whether um, Mercedes should have pulled out. Yeah, and it was very interesting listening to. So we should say that um, Carfer, you did a re-upload, sort of, yeah, um, slightly reskin of of the interview with, yeah, with we, Norman. Yeah, we re um, we remastered our piece that we did with him a few years ago. Uh, it's on the channel. I recommend you check it out. You, I haven't seen it before. Really recommend you go and check it out because it is just it's one of those lovely things. It, it's quite long. It's about forty minutes long, isn't yeah. it? And it's it's worth just get a cup of tea and um, hot cross bun or something like that. Sit yeah, down it, it, it is a great piece. He goes lovely. he goes into a lot of detail because he, he mm -hmm. raced with Jaguar who did end up winning that race. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, I sort of, I'm reading you know, Duncan Hamilton's, Duncan Hamilton's, who's racing for uh, Jaguar as well, his sort of view of it and just different people's views at the time of that incident and stuff. And he, yeah, it's, it's very interesting listening to Norman's take on it, mm. all, I think, because um, it can appear harsh and you, I'd always sort of wondered about Jaguar's decision to, to keep going but it yeah. does all make sense and it's, um, I mean now um, it's in a conspiracy theory about um, Mercedes as well which I thought was mm. quite sort of well the, uh, Norman kind of touches on hints at that a little bit in the piece but the um, nowadays if anything like that happened the race would be get red flagged like immediately st stop there would be no way that that would continue but um, yeah they had to continue the race and, and uh, Mercedes pulled out but Jaguar continued on racing and they were criticized for a very long mm. time for also not having pulled out so Jaguar with um with Norman Dewis ended up winning that one but that's only one of the the stories that that Norman goes into in the piece um he's got some great stories about setting uh speed records at Yabaka in uh in Belgium in modified in modified C types where they were you, the, you, by the way, can pronounce that correctly. I, I obviously look at it and go, Jebeki. And <laughs> well, the thing is, Belgian can be weird because I speak Dutch, which is, is grammatically identical to Flemish. So for, for some Belgian words, I can say it properly. But for the southern part of Belgium where they speak French, I'm, I'm lost. My French isn't good. But Yabaka would be how I pronounce it. It was probably wrong anyway. Um, but yeah, the modified uh, C-type with a, uh, a glider bubble. Mm. Perspex bubble on top just to create better aero. Um, and you, he talks about the speeds he's doing in these cars, like mm. 170 miles an hour in a car with 
not just no driver aids, it had no seat. They took the seat out so they could get the bubble in. So he sat on the floor of the car with the steering wheel up here. Um, fair, that's what I do with the catering. But. Yes. Well, uh, I, yeah, I think <laughs> not at 170, not miles, 170 an miles an hour. The For man, all sorts of reasons. Yeah. <laughs> the man was an absolute legend, yeah. uh, uh, not only in what he achieved, but he was also, also a uh, terrifically nice man mm -hmm. and deserved every one of the 98 years he was given. Um, uh, so yeah I do absolutely recommend that you go and uh, check out that film it has uh, yeah it's a wonderful story and it's uh, even if you'd never heard of him before he's definitely someone you should have heard of uh, and we were very sad to hear about his passing um, uh, but speaking about Le Mans uh, by the time you watch this Le Mans will have been but for us Le Mans is in the future so I'm going there with George so I think about now we can cut in some of the footage of me and George at Le Mans. Thank you, Studio Drew. Now, going to Le Mans isn't just about attending the race. The journey getting there can be just as part of the experience. And we're being hosted by Bentley on the way down. So Bentley brought us here to Brooklyn's, so arguably the home of all motorsport, really, with the world's first purpose-filled track, just hints of it just over there. And they've supplied a bunch of Bentleys for us to drive down in. We've got a Molzan Speed. We've got the brand new Bentega Speed. We've got a GT3R. There's the last of the Azures and the last of the Continental Rs over there that we're getting to drive. But our first leg of the journey is going to be in a brand spanking new Continental GTC, the convertible. And the weather's holding out, so our first leg will hopefully be dry. Let's hit the road. We made it all the way to Le Mans in the selection of Bentleys. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to drive the Continental R because someone, not me, had a small accident in it and it is no longer joining us on the fleet. But we got to drive everything else behind us from the, uh, the wonderful GTC, which I'm definitely getting back in because it was a fabulous car, to the Azure, which we kind of fell in love with a little bit. It looks like it might be from the 70s, but it's actually a 2003 car, but it feels a lot more vintage than that. And not only are we going to drive that to the track this morning to start seeing the race, we're actually going to get to do a parade lap of the south a few hours before the race in that car. It's going to be kind of special. This thing has a wastegate sound that sounds like a gentleman breathing. <sighs> Rather than a This is a very civilized car. One of the extra little bits of privilege we've been given that the 2019 24 hours of Lamar is a, a pit walk access. So we're gonna walk up and down and just take in some of the, the tantalizing glimpses of what the actual race is going to be like. Now, if you remember back in 2016, we did a documentary with Aston Martin. And we actually filmed right here in the pits during the race itself. We're not doing that this year, but it is a nice reminder of what that was like being here. There's a real buzz about the place. And still an hour to go before the race. So if you come in first, second or third at Le Mans in your class, you get to go up there. And if you work at Carfection, you get to stand under it. Thank <laughs> you. 
and that was me at Le Mans. <laughs> <laughs> just like that um <laughs> i'm sure fun times were had and, i'm sure they were yes yeah. and 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 the winner <laughs> congratulations to them yeah. uh it's a gt class that kind of we're i'm looking forward to certainly well yeah. the the we've seen a lot of uh well by this point we will have shown uh, uh what's happened in the piece but yeah the gt class hopefully will have been very interesting because yeah. uh, lmp1 is just it's hard and a lot of the big names pulling out it's not quite as as uh, interesting but there's 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 a lot of diversity out there and uh, i'm sure i had a good time um i'm sure you did we we've had some great films going out on the channel recently um i really liked your film at windrush um oh, thank you very much which was uh if you don't mind me saying quite nerdy yes well it was one of those things that sort of when we got the call would we like to come and film down there and it's you know a lot of stuff goes into thinking whether you know, the, the instinct is just go yeah that sounds great you know car park full of supercars and you think hang on a minute actually how are we going to make a film out of this and then you discover that obviously quite a few of the cars are going to have covers on them and a few people did ask well you know given you've covered up number plates why did, but some of the cars um would be very obvious who owned them if you know from instagram and stuff these days yeah. because of the spec they are basically yeah. and people you know don't want people knowing so that's why anyway we left the covers on a lot of the cars but some of them were were uncovered and we were trying to think how are we going to make this engaging and then yeah as soon as i started talking to tim and he started saying some of the things that how they look after these cars and i was like yes that's the sort of stuff i find it generally speaking if i'm standing there listening to somebody thinking i find this fascinating hopefully hopefully everyone else will, everyone as, well. Else will as well and that's the kind of reaction has been very good to it yeah um, it's been really nice if you haven't seen it the uh we managed to go into a lot of detail about how you keep a very expensive car not just stored well, but ready to go. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Cause somebody commented um, under my Instagram, in fact, post I put up um, with some photos, at Henry Catchpole. There you go. Oh, got, got the plug in there. Got the plug in. Uh, yeah, wow. Um, saying, oh, surely these are all just sort of, you know, it's a shame to see you know, all these garage queens down there. And that's not the point of it. Yes, I'm sure some of them do stay down there for a long time and it's not sort of, don't see the light of day as much as you would wish. But the point of Windrush is that all the cars are down there and it's the fact that these effectively time poor very rich people can ring up at the drop of a hat and say i'd like to take my 288 gto out for a drive whereas if they were storing it themselves even if they'd sort of done a lot of the things that windrush would do they would probably think oh, it's going to take time to yeah do it they might think i've got half a day but to be honest it's going to take me a good hour and a bit or whatever to get this car to a point where i can take it out on the road and check it starts and check it does this so i won't bother so it takes out that sort of you know just easy turn up turn the key drive off take it away for a couple of hours drive and actually use it so yeah the the idea is that these cars should get used more often because of the way they're stored by by windrush which yeah. is nice yeah it's um i think it costs about six thousand pounds a year per yeah. car um which actually if you've got if you're spent several hundred thousand pounds on your car collection seems like a worthwhile investment to keep it running yeah that's more I was, money than i, was I can afford thinking, but yeah exactly i was thinking i mean that's that's a, but then you put it into context yeah. and like all these things yeah if you paid two million pounds for a car or something like that and there was a sheer on down there then yeah six grand a year is not a lot to Seem, you can use seem, it when you want and keep it in pretty good keep it in yeah keep it in london as well yeah but the, yeah they go into a lot of detail uh, uh another recommendation is to check that one out i'm going to throw in what the hashtag is here because people won't know to scroll oh, to this bit wow. the hashtag is hashtag best friends if you use hashtag best friends in the comments on youtube <laughs> we will definitely respond to your question there you go um <laughs> we've done a lot of bmws don't give it away they'll know when to scroll to um why am I trying to trick you? <laughs> but anyway, the real fans already knew that from last time. Yeah. Um, uh, we've done quite a bit of BMW stuff, actually, uh, especially in the convertible range, because you've um, yes. done Z4 M40i and the M850i convertibles. Yes. So you spent a lot of time with the top down in BMWs. I have, yes. It's just absolutely. the way it's worked we did, out. We did actually film the Z4 quite a while ago as well. So Don't I know um, it? Yeah. I know. <laughs> We're waiting yeah, Charlie for Charlie again. to finish not, that not edit. my fault. Can I? I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, and that film was actually really as much about the road as it was about the car. So even if, if you've looked at the film and seen the thumbnail and thought, oh, BMW Z4, not really interesting, please, I do recommend going and check it out just because the road is extraordinary and it's it's yeah one of the best roads i've ever been to and i've been to a lot of a lot of good roads over the years it's just it was so quiet down there southern spain 
um, Alto de Velafique, and it was yeah, it was good. And then M eight fifty I not in Spain. No, it was not. <laughs> it was in the Cotswolds, and uh, yeah, I kind of. It was strange because I the M eight fifty I convertible, I liked it. There was it was fundamentally very good. You know, yeah. didn't drive like a two ton car. It was you know perfectly structurally rigid enough and sounded good with a V eight. It just yeah it, it wasn't doing anything wrong. It's a sort of this age old thing of there are no bad cars these days, and and this certainly wasn't a a bad car. Yeah, looks nice, but it just felt a bit sort of. I don't know, like a you sort of throw your sweater over your shoulders and go down to the golf club in an age where people are, I don't know, base jumping or something like that when they retire. You know, it, it sort of just felt like a slightly anachronistic yeah. car. Yeah, I think sense. I think a lot of people, in, yeah, I'm raising an eyebrow at base jumping pensioners. Yeah, I but, know, but you know what I mean. So um, from triathlon, no, perhaps, that's what they go and do or something. You know, it, it's, it's the price point, yeah. When, when you compare it to what else you can get for that amount of money, it yeah. becomes a difficult proposition to kind of justify. It feels like a big leap up from where the uh, 6 Series was, which is essentially the yeah. car it's replacing. So, yeah, there we are. It's... Um, if it appeals and that's what you want, then absolutely no, you won't find me saying you've made a bad decision because it's not a bad car. No. But yeah, there, there are you the go. things I'd have for the money. So for a hundred, well, hundred and twenty grand, that car. That's a lot of I, money. Yeah, when I actually you look at the spec of that particular car, it was had another, it's hundred and seven list and yeah, hundred and twenty as we tested it. So yeah. Well, have a look at the video uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, in the description below, as you've probably already noticed by now, there are chapter markers so you can jump. Uh, uh, and links to the, the videos that we mentioned. So uh, check that out. Um, and we know that we will be driving the uh, full M8 later this year as well. Mm. So this is yeah. kind of a nice warming up. But we are running very long on this episode. So yeah. I think it's about time to draw a line on the footlock for this week. Can I just say I drove my Escort at the weekend? People are very eager to hear about your escort, so that can, we've absolutely <laughs> yeah. got time for that. I was just, I, I literally, it's, I finally taxed it, and it's got an MOT on it. And um, it was, I went to a village fete and appeared there as sort of um, it appeared. An, an attraction, just oh. sort of kind of. So I cleaned it with my friend Paul. Uh, he very kindly came and helped me out, um, helped me jumpstart it, and um, then put a bit of juice into the battery and stuff. And then we we actually spent some time because it was a bit dusty and kind of and still had a bit of oil in the engine bay, sort of from stuff basically hadn't been cleaned since i last went rallying in it so um yeah and actually once we'd finished with it it looked really good i was i was just concourse how good ready it, how it, yeah i wouldn't go that far but it kind of yeah it looked all right and it was it was so nice just to have it out so i've got to go and go and give it a drive around the lanes i've got a new bought a new battery for it very smart sort of competition um type thing and um so i treated it with that so we need to wire that in at the weekend and um crimp things and put it on be fine yeah paul knows what he's doing <laughs> fair enough uh, a lot of you have been asking for uh, more coverage of the escort so um i think that means that uh we should definitely yeah give that a yeah, go that'd be good um the e53 is actually what i used to jump it as well which is my obviously long term at the moment which there is been a video of we did, yes, we did. Debris, it was we an unboxing we did an unboxing video one before i went on holiday yeah um and we posed a question in that uh for you to give us questions for henry to answer on the next uh long term update so please get those in yeah you could use the hashtag that we revealed earlier <gasps> oh for anyone that skipped forward and uh, thinks it's nearly at the yeah. end or oh. um yes <laughs> uh or you can ask us directly yeah. uh on uh, instagram at carfection films on twitter at carfection or henry directly on either of those at henry catchpole or me at drew stern um we we have most certainly run out of time uh, so I will say goodbye we will see you next time at Footlock thank you so much for joining us and staying all the way to the end I know quite a few of you actually do and I say it every week but I definitely mean it you guys who have watched the entire episode are our most dedicated fans and if there's anything we can do to make your experience better you just let us know using that hashtag that we mentioned earlier <laughs> anyway for now from me from us it's goodbye and we'll see you next time thank you very much for watching <laughs>